Today, I want to talk about one of the most controversial subjects on the internet, and that is cycle thinking. Please don't get me wrong in the fact that I am so excited that female health is really just all over the place. I'm Kayla Barnes Lenz. I'm an expert in female longevity. I've been studying the topic for over a decade. I am the most publicly measured woman in the world. We have two incredibly uh, disparate groups here. We have some women saying that cycle thinking is absolutely necessary. And then we have other women, and these are both PhDs, keep in mind. So we have two PhDs with completely opposing views, both of which I have spoken to, one of which has been on the podcast. And so I want to give my feedback on what I think about cycle thinking. A little bit of history. So I used to never amend anything um, in terms of my workouts. I personally don't have any PMS symptoms. I just have never struggled with that. So obviously that gives me an advantage, right? So. I probably can maintain more consistent training throughout the entire cycle. Then I did try cycle thinking. So what is cycle thinking? So cycle thinking is the idea and it's based on biology. So when we're in the follicular phase of our cycle, which is days about one through 14 to 16, we have the highest amounts of estrogen. So estrogen can help us recover faster. Our basal body temperature is also lower so we can potentially have better endurance during ovulation or around ovulation. In cycle thinking theory would be we have the highest energy levels, our best PRs, et cetera. And then as we move into that luteal phase or the second half of the cycle after ovulation through the end of the cycle, we see our body uh, temperature increase. So we can see the sun aura ring, any sort of wearable, or you just feel it. So we are hotter um, just as a baseline. We also know that the progesterone can make us more sleepy, more tired, maybe not as energetic. So the concept of cycle thinking is that you front load all of your highest intensity exercise, your highest loads of strength training into that follicular phase. And then you might do other activities such as maybe yoga or Pilates or light workouts in the second half of the cycle. Now, as someone who has obviously done both, I think that there is merit, of course, to the fact that female bodies change throughout the cycle. But what we also know is a few things. Number one, the science really doesn't support cycle thinking. All of the outcomes seem to point to the same idea that women can lay on muscle, whether or not you're in the follicular phase or the luteal phase, and there doesn't seem to be much difference in terms of training. So where does that leave us? And what do I think that we should do? It's really important to consider the fact that if we are cycle thinking and we are purposely down-regulating our cycle, for half of the month, every single month, our longevity goals are going to be incredibly difficult to achieve. So what are longevity goals? We need to be improving our cardiovascular system, our VO2 max, our strength training. So if we only do that at half of the cycle every month, then we're not going to be getting the optimal health or longevity benefits of exercise as much as we would if we were consistently doing that strength training, cardiovascular training, and even high intensity exercise. My thoughts are on this and what I have really landed on is that number one, you should understand your cycle. So understanding when you're in that follicular phase, if you're ovulating and when you're in that luteal phase is the first step of really optimizing your exercise programming for you as a bio-individual. There are many women that are actually having inovulatory cycles. So this means they're not ovulating women with PCOS or a variety of different conditions. If you're not ovulating, then you're actually estrogen dominant throughout the entire cycle. So that's step two. Step one is understanding the cycle. Step two is tracking if you're actually even ovulating. This is also important for overall health because we know ovulation is a sign of a healthy body. How do we measure if we're ovulating? There's a few ways that we can do this. On a very basic wearable or an integration, for example, with natural cycles and aura ring, this can help to indicate if you're ovulating. So what you're going to see is a steady rise and maintaining that increase in basal body temperature in the second half of the cycle. That indicates that you've ovulated. If you want to take it a step further, you can also look at something like ovulation um, strip, or I do the Mira um, at home hormone monitor. So we can look and see, we will see a large surge in LH right before ovulation. We will see an increase in progesterone after ovulation. We can certainly confirm that you have ovulated this way. I'll go into more detail on that in a future video because I have actually tested my hormones every day for the last 60 days or so on Mira to understand what's actually going on in my body. So. Next step is it's not that we throw out bioindividuality or the fact that we are women for strength training. So let's talk about what I do. Instead of automatically down-regulating my strength training, my HIIT training, and my cardiovascular training, 
This is what I do. I use my personal wearable data to determine if I should move one of the days of maybe higher intensity training to another day later when I'm more recovered. There is something that I wanna make very clear though, as it relates to wearables. Wearables are not necessarily optimized for female health. So when we get into that luteal phase, a few things happen in our body. The basal body temperature increases, our HRV typically decreases because our heart's also beating a little bit faster. And wearables are not necessarily optimized to have the most precision as it relates to the luteal phase. So what does that really mean? That basically means that you might see lower HRV even if you're feeling absolutely incredible in the luteal phase. I see this myself, I'm sure you have as well. So it's not only on the wearable data because we know that we're gonna see a down regulation in our HRV metrics. We'll see an uptick potentially in our resting heart rate. So what we can do is look at trends over time. So that can be really important. I also am very excited for wearables to kind of catch up and realize, okay, you're in the luteal phase. Let's optimize this. Let me tell you a real indication of your HRV on this given day. But let me give you an example. So I've been traveling a ton and it's such a blessing, but it also can take a toll on the body. So I got back from New York City. This was, I had been in London before that. So traveling time zones, different countries, et cetera. And so when I got back, it was a Monday and I was meant to be doing a really intense leg day. So instead of doing that really intense leg day, I didn't feel the most recovered. So my HRV indicated that. And when I'm talking about HRV dips, I'm not talking about a small HRV dip. I'm talking about a significant HRV dip and my personal reporting of how I felt that day was not so good. So there's two days of my training schedules that are much more intense, my leg day and then also my VO2 max training day. So instead of doing that leg day on the Monday as per my schedule, um, I shifted that. So I gave myself about three or four days of really high quality sleep focused on optimizing. I jumped in the HBOT chamber, whatever it is that helps you recover. And then I pushed that day out instead of just completely eliminating it because I was in my luteal phase, push that day out to a later time in my cycle and in my week so that I was more recovered. So I was looking for these um, really noticeable shifts in HRV. And if you're dealing with PMS symptoms, this also would be a time to determine how do you actually feel? What do your metrics say? So I love the idea of operating on data instead of just this cycle thinking. Please don't get me wrong in the fact that I am so excited that female health is really just all over the place. It's in the news, it's in the media, we're looking for solutions, and I want to find solutions along with you, of course, right? I am a firm believer that women are very different than men. Actually, we're gonna do an entire series on female longevity risks, so things we should be looking for and optimizing for female health, and there really are so many, but this is an area that I want to just kind of set the record straight because I would be so sad if women are all just down-regulating their training schedules, missing out on those longevity benefits because they have heard this buzz term of cycle syncing. So that's how I do it. I would love any feedback from you, but it's data-driven, not just something that we've seen on the internet. I'm Kayla Barnes Lenz. I'm an expert in female longevity. I've been studying the topic for over a decade. I am the most publicly measured woman in the world, and I travel all over the globe speaking about female longevity. So if you're interested in more content like this, um, please feel free to share this video, subscribe, like, comment. It truly does mean the world. And um, see you on the next video.